Thank you, Kevin. Um, oh, humbled, which maybe is hard for me, but I'm very humbled by this award. And I, I've got a lot to thank okay, to Kevin and the whole Denver Business Journal, not only for covering the news in our state, the business, the things that are impacting people's lives, but to taking the time to focus and dig in on energy, which is really the engine behind all the other industries. And they do a tremendous job at that with passion and can bring a crowd like this in the room today. I've got to thank my wonderful mother who's here today. I can't talk much about her, I'll cry. Um, I, I would not be here, I wouldn't be anything like I was if not for the support and love of my mother. My tremendous wife. <laughs> My wife, Liz, who's fabulous, for those who know her, as, as people tell me all the time, I outkick the coverage there. Um, my daughter, Skylar, who's brought so much love and fun and sass into the family. And my broader family at Liberty. I've just been incredibly lucky to work around such wonderful people. And I also want to thank everyone else in this room who's dedicated your careers and your energies and efforts to energy. Because energy matters a lot. Everywhere and always, the quality of life, the human condition has been linked to the affordability and the availability of energy. I'll talk about two large energy transitions. The first one, roughly 10,000 years ago, the invention of agriculture, which actually spread at a reasonable clip for a few million humans spread around the planet at that time. But agriculture allowed people to produce massively more energy in the, in the form that feeds humans. Grains, digestible calories for humans. It transformed the world. It tra the transformation was dramatic. It led to this explosion in the growth of human population, permanent settlement cities for the first time, written language, culture, arts, architecture. I could go on and on. When we were, when we were foragers, scrounging around the world, it was dramatically different. The one thing the first energy transition failed at was it didn't improve the lot in life of the average Joe. Didn't improve human life expectancy, didn't, didn't appear to meaning, meaningfully improve health. People lived 30 years or so life expectancy before agriculture, global life expectancy for the thousands of years after the invention of agriculture, about the same. It did enrich a small crew. We became a more hierarchical society. Kings and queens and traders and people over these large gatherings of people, they became enriched. Their lives were different. But for the vast majority of humanity, things were different, but their lot in life was not. Fast forward to only around 200 years ago, we started a dramatic second energy transition the arrival of fossil fuels. And another way to say it is just the arrival of abundant, affordable energy that could be gathered locally. Deforestation rolled down as fossil fuels came in. The impacts on the environment were enormously positive as well. I think there was another ingredient, not just fossil fuels in my view, is that the arrival of human liberty. Human societies were top down, whether it was emperor or king or chief or whatever. They were to feudal societies, the Lord. People were subjects of someone. And in just the last two, three hundred years, we've had a growth of bottom-up societal organization, replacing top-down organization. This unleashed innovation, economic growth. Uh, as Amartya said, a Nobel Prize winning economist uh, said so well, freedom is not only the most efficient way to, to create things, it's an end in itself. We started allowing people to be authors of their lives. Two hundred years ago, before the first oil and gas well was drilled, slavery was spread in most of the major societies around the world. It was 120 years ago, there was no place on earth where women had the right to vote. This growth of bubbling up societal organization, turbocharged by affordable, abundant energy, just massively transformed humanity to unrecognizable conditions today. Uh, a, couple, a couple numbers on that. A doubling of human life expectancy in less than, less than the last 200 years. And if we just talk about economic well-being, 200 years ago, 90% of humanity lived on less than $2 a day in today's terms. Just imagine that. 
Today it's 9%. So we went from the vast majority of humanity to 9%. 9% is still 700 million people living on less than $2 a day. The second energy transition, you not only brought planes, trains, and automobiles and modern medicine, but it also enabled us other innovative ways to produce energy. The materials and wealth allowed us to build large-scale hydroelectric energy, led to the arrival of the nuclear power industry, geothermal energy, and more recently, or more explosively recently, wind and solar energy are enabled by this, and they're on a rapid growth trajectory. I mean, this is an exciting time to be in energy. Now, the second energy, tra the second energy transition is not done. We have today a billion people in the world with no access to electricity, another billion with only a few hours a day of electricity. That prevents them, their incomes rising up and their productivity rising up. A third of humanity, two and a half billion people, still cook the way our ancestors did. Indoor, in huts, or small buildings, burning wood, <coughs> dung predominantly. Um, our ancestors lived that way, but we know what their lives were like. This indoor, indoor air pollution from traditional fuels kills three million people every year. Simply finishing an energy transition there, there is millions of annual lives that would be saved. A um, few words about myself. I was lucky, you know, when I was born, I, I grew up eight or 10 miles south of here. I didn't worry about where energy was coming from. When I hit a light switch, the light went on. Um, my parents moved into a nice school district. I went to Cherry Creek schools from first grade through through college, I mean through high school. And I was, you know, sort of in summary, a, a, a science geek probably migrating towards a tech nerd. And there was a mania of that day, you know, that was fearful and struck fear into me and was around. That was, we were running out of everything. Energy most predominantly among that, but other things as well. The society world as we know it is coming, is gonna go down. So science guy, I want to travel the world. I want the people that don't have energy to get it. That set the, the future of my career. I specifically chose to go to MIT to work on plasma physics and work on fusion energy. Here's an awesome energy dense dispatchable source of energy that just takes human ingenuity to get there. Hard problem. We've made enormous progress, not there yet. I went to graduate school at UC Berkeley and worked in solar energy. After I left graduate school, I spent two or three years working on geothermal energy. What we what was called hot dry rock, now they call it enhanced geothermal systems. Pump water underground, access hot rock, mine the heat and produce electricity. So, and then I went into oil and gas and I've spent most of my career in oil and gas. But I, I don't care where energy comes from. Energy just needs to be abundant, affordable, so it lifts people's lives up and has as small as impact as possible in the world around us. That's my goal, that's my dream. I said it was a science geek. Maybe a quick reflection on scientists. So as a kid, I loved to read, I loved to understand science, I loved to read biographies of scientists. Think of what I think are indisputably the two greatest scientists of all time. Isaac Newton's simply unbelievable mind of, of what he did. But he's the first guy that explained gravity and how forces work and how force makes the body to accelerate and forces against resistance takes energy. Without using the word, he's the first guy that gave the physics to quantify energy. He also invented calculus, an incredibly important tool in any kind of energy, any kind of engineering. My dad was never forgiven him for that, but, uh, but calculus has been helpful. He, he set the groundwork for, the, for, for understanding and quantifying energy. So fast forward 250 years and Albert Einstein comes along. Right? E equals MC squared, maybe he's most famous for. That is the fundamental basis behind nuclear energy, both fission and fusion. They can transform matter into enormous energy sources. He won the Nobel Prize, actually, for the photoelectric effect. That's the principle on which solar panels work and drives the solar industry. Um, of course, he did that relativity thing as well. These guys, and the third one I put, in fact, I'm wearing a shirt with Maxwell's equations on my shirt under my, under my uh, button down here, was a set of four equations that explained how electricity and light and magnetic fields interact. This is electricity transmission. This is all generators, thermal hybrid plants that generate electricity. This is how light propagates and what governs that. So I think it's no coincidence 
that the three, I think, best and certainly most impactful scientists of all time, all of them, the center of their work was in energy. Because if you impact energy, you impact everyone. You impact humanity. I'm gonna be much less controversial than the crowd today. I'm not speaking much about today, but I, I will say a couple comments about today. The recent, you know, I don't know, last five, 10, I don't know the words, recent years, the absolute hyper-politicization of energy is a significant headwind, headwind for progress today. Because what happens when things are hyper-politicized, right? Rationality, trade-offs, thought, those go out the window. What's the most powerful, most effective force in politics? Fear. So on every side, whatever your agenda is, right, the tool of the day discussing energy is fear. This slows innovation, it's paralysis for transformation and improvement. Heck, I have a bunch of friends in the renewable energy industry, wind, wind and solar developers. Incredibly hard to permit to do something today. Um, we're, we're paralyzing progress, we're slowing innovation, and of course we're spreading fear where I think the vast majority of it isn't justified at all. And it's a pathology among children today. I'll end, I'll try to go more upbeat now. <laughs> in this holiday times, Look, so step back to the big picture, the, 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 the progress recently of humans, and, and in large part enabled by advancements of energy. The story of the last 200 years is the, is the greatest story ever. And, and to use one other number, I'm a, I'm a tech nerd, right? I gotta throw numbers around. Over the last 25 years, 130,000 people are lifted out of extreme poverty every single day. Every day, people are going from living on less than $2 a day and they're rising up. Over 100 million people every year are moving from traditional fuels, mostly to liquid petroleum gas, but they're burning cleaner fuels and living longer lives. Um, so let's be thankful for the lives we have, for the energy that's made our lives possible. Let's never forget that those that don't have it yet. But thank you for all the work you do, and please, everyone in this room in the energy industry, keep everything you've got as you have to, it's got you here. Give everything you've got because all of humanity, particularly those not energy rich yet, all of them are counting on us. Thank you all very much. God bless you for working with energy.